This is SFNet Presents In The Know with host Barry Bobro, sponsored by Hilco Global. Well, welcome to the third podcast in the In The Know series. I'm your host, Barry Bobro. My guest today is Maria DeCaos, head of loans contributions at Refinitiv. Today, Maria and I are going to have a very deep dive conversation about first half numbers for the leveraged debt market as well as the asset base market. Well, welcome, welcome, Maria. It's great to see you. Uh, and um, before we before we dive in, I just want to let everybody know that I've known Maria. Uh, actually, I think I first met you when you started up the the asset based league table, which I'm embarrassed to say is probably around 2003 or four somewhere in there. And you've been a great, become a very good friend and also a great. Uh, supporter and partner for the asset based industry. So I really want to want to thank you for joining me on this this new venture. And I'm My really pleasure. looking forward to the discussion of uh, of second quarter, first half 22 uh, and album. So welcome. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Delighted to be here. Great. So, hey, Maria, before we before we get into any numbers and we've got lots of numbers today, uh, t- talk a little bit about your role at Refinitiv, because it's actually quite a bit larger than just just a little old asset-based industry. Sure. Um, so I head up global loans contributions at um, Refinitiv LPC, and uh, which is a, a company owned by um, LSEG, the London Stock Exchange. Um, and what I focus on is the collection and vetting of quality loan market data um, in in the broadly syndicated large corporate middle market ABL community. So um, that's my mandate. And then I also focus a lot on analysis because it's something I love. And that's how I came across ABL and uh, love. We're glad you did. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, let's let's dive into uh, some numbers here. Let's talk. Let's just do uh, Mm -hmm. from 30,000 feet. Let's talk about leverage loan and bond issuance uh, year to date and, and get into this, the, the macro on the loan market. Sure, sure. So obviously there were challenging market conditions um, this year across the credit spectrum. Um, in the context of the leverage loan market specifically, we saw um, more volatility in, uh, for buy side players, sell side players, and that in turn sort of created unsettled pipelines, um, returns were impacted, deal structures, um, and and um, certainly ultimately the the volumes. Um, I think the best place to start is where we were at the beginning of the year, um, coming into uh, 2022. We had a lot of market momentum, which was sort of reminiscent to transactors of pre-COVID market conditions, and suddenly in 2Q. Um, on the heels of certain inflation numbers being announced, Fed actions, there was growing recessionary fears and and the market became much more difficult to to navigate. And across the credit spectrum, we saw um, volumes volumes fall. Um, As these charts um, indicate, you know, loan and bond, Volumes uh, declined um, uh, precipitously. That was on the back of several um, outflows and 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 just um, the absence of opportunistic financings. Um, I don't know yeah. if if you want to. Well, add anytime something. you see anytime you see the the secondary prices trade as low as they have, I guess the first comment. Uh, it's been an orderly market, which is actually yes. very positive. It hasn't been a cathartic Definitely. drop. It's been orderly. But anytime mm-hmm. you see the pricing drop that much, it, it makes it much more difficult to uh, to price new primary uh, and certainly to take underwriting risk on new primary. And so not surprising. And, and the underlying driver is just uncertainty about, I mean, how do you how do you how do you value a company, let alone the debt that it, that it that supports if you if you're not sure what inflation is, what supply chain is doing to it, what EBITDA right. is going to be, what the outlook looks like. So. You know, huge fall in M and A volume driven drives uh, uh, uncertainty. It makes it harder to price, and then the the end result is what you see in the chart there: just big drip and dip in volume, and uh, and that's kind of I think where we where we ended. Uh, right, and I think it's important to kind of note, and I'm sure we'll we'll talk about this. You know, liquidity in contrast to what we saw, you know, during the last credit crisis and and, and all that, liquidity didn't dry up. It it stayed in place. 
it, it was just the deployment of capital became a lot more um, selective. That's and, right. and, and so I think that's an important differentiation. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, I don't want to get too too lost in SOFR, but a, a lot of volume and a lot of market activity around SOFR. So let's let's talk about that. What are you seeing from a Refinitiv's pr perspective? Sure. So what we saw was that the deal flow that did come to the market was heavily weighted towards refinancings and, and largely um, LIBOR replacement constructs. And, and um, I think that given the fact that the market as a whole was, was struggling, the fact that the lenders and borrowers generally coalesced around the steady adoption of term SOFR in an otherwise difficult um, quarter actually allowed for volumes to, to, to stay reasonable and steady and, and, and all of that. Um, I think what this, what these two charts show is, especially the one on the left, um, we saw SOFR perform as we would expect it to perform in anticipation of an ongoing rising rate environment. And, and that's good. It performed as we would expect. Um, the, the market seemed to come uh, coalesce around a flat credit spread adjustment of 10 basis points. Yeah. So I think what what you know what we're looking at now and what we're thinking about right now is will this flat rate stay in place? Because it certainly works um, if you're borrowing for 30 days, but it's it's less. Um, uh, well, um, another way to say it is, I mean, given the term structure of SOFR, if if, right. if, if, if you do, if you have a flat rate. Then, uh, if if the borrower goes longer on their on their borrowing option, uh, they're actually uh, the lender is making a lower yield, and that's. But so it's interesting that the markets coalesce there. Although I would say, and we probably want to move on from it. Most of the borrowings historically, a huge percentage, are at 30 days. So it's, yeah. it's more of a hypothetical uh, issue. Yeah. yeah but if I, I could ask you one question, and actually, this is yeah, sure. um, the the other one. Do do you think that right now the 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 market has um, likes the transparency that the credit spread adjustment offers. Mm -hmm. Do you think that a year from now, um, two years from now, the credit spread adjustment will be as relevant? Or do you think that the market will sort of do away with it? And I, I, I think I think ultimately it probably goes away, um, partly because issuers are going to keep pushing to eliminate it and, and uh, lenders are going to have to find a way to recoup their spread uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think things will normalize. But right now, it's pretty transparent. Yep. 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 No, I Interestingly, I, and the next slide here, I mean, you just, and I'll, I'll take this one, but the, yeah. the, the, there's still a lot of LIBOR debt out there. Yeah. So, we, you know, a lot, the transition's been orderly, but still a lot to go. Uh, more more LIBOR loans than there are SOFR loans so far. And that's that's kind of interesting. Like, you know, what does the rest of the year bring? All that, your question, it will, it'll play out over the next year, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, what about yields? Yields. Um, so obviously, um, there was pressure on um, spreads um, as well as um, uh, OIDs. We saw yields um, increase, so um, uh, not not surprising, especially in the um, in the first lien market. I think that bank lenders, in particular, just um, we're focused on senior debt, and and um, capital became a lot more precious, and and um, so I think that th this chart captures that really well. Yeah, substantial increase, which probably contributes to the to the lower volume too. It's just it's just not as attractive, certainly for an right. opportunistic financing. That's right. That's right. 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 This is this is your uh, your survey. Yep. Yep. So um, as, as you and, and um, many of your colleagues and peers know, um, Refinitiv LPC runs a quarterly survey every year where we poll um, market transactors. Um, and and uh, there are a couple of, of takeaways that, that we can um, see here. Um, what I think that the top level um, observation is that in 2Q, there was sort of a new nervousness, a new wariness that entered the market. 
And, and the recurring theme that a couple of um, folks mentioned is that if we could just see inflation level off and come down, that will just help um, mitigate the market uncertainty and kind of get the engine going for for um, new deals and and um, you know that would in turn feed on itself. Um, but but these are sort of the high level takeaways that that um, that, that that folks um, uh, focused on during um, the our discussions. I don't know yeah. if there's any. No, the interesting in thing to me is that I it's consistent with a lot of the discussions that I have with people is everybody's concerned about credit risk, but you haven't actually seen it in your portfolio yeah. yet. It's more like the. The weather map where you can see the storms out there you're not sure if they're coming your way but they're definitely there and so it's it's you know how are people reacting to that well they're getting more cautious but it's not reflecting yet in the default rates any other, anywhere that we've seen is it no no i i think that's that's exactly right i do think that the that folks because of this nervousness i do think that folks generally expect that the quietness that we've observed in the market will sort of stay in place for for a little while. Um, and you know, there are different opportunities that may or may not um, uh, emerge as as a result. I think that you know we with with bids um, with loans being bid so low, and then kind of that volatility. A couple of folks decided that they were going to bypass the primary market altogether and and you know purchase in the second um in the secondary market and ride it back up um hopefully so i i think that there's just a couple of mm -hmm. different dynamics in in play i don't think anybody's necessarily sitting at home <laughs> but yeah. i think that no, there i think different I, dynamics. I was talking with uh, uh somebody yesterday reminded me that that both the, the institutional market and the the high yield our flow markets you know yeah. yeah there's some inflows and outflows at the margin but but if nothing else happens they clip coupons on interest so they pile up cash and so i think there's lots yes. of cash waiting yeah. for the right place to deploy let's right. um let's go into uh the, the topic that seems to be at every conference that, that's going on right now on everybody's lips is the, the expansion of direct lending in the face of that volatility. Sure. So I think that, you know, as these two two charts um, indicate, we've seen a surge in direct um, lender led buyouts um, in the middle market, but certainly also in the large corporate market. I think that, you know, there there are in, in, in terms of um, numbers, direct lenders have been able to provide about over four and a half times more LBO financing to middle markets than the broadly syndicated market. Yeah, 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 amazing. And 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 I think that there are kind of a couple of 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 reasons for that. First of all, I think we, you know, as you mentioned, there's just a different paradigm that's emerging. Um, it's, um, you know, the, the direct lenders are, are, um, are in play. They have a lot of capital. They provide a service that's fairly unique, sort of seamless execution. Um, it's, it's, you know, they're in play and, and they're able right now to price a heck of a lot e more easily than the broadly syndicated loan mm -hmm. market. Yep. Yep. For sure. So, so let's, uh, here, we've got another couple of slides here on, on right. direct lending. Yeah. So I think, again, this this is just echoes what, what we've been talking about. For the moment, the direct lender market is just um, more insulated from the volatility that we've seen in the in the broadly syndicated loan market. Um, yeah, it's been a much more stable now. source of fundraising, right? I mean, they yeah. raise their money and have the money versus uh, having to continuing to come back to market. So there's been all this money raised and uh, and they're deploying it. It's a so it's just it's a it's a completely different supply and demand dynamic, which is really benefiting direct lending right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that they're just from a liquidity standpoint, like you said, there's there's just infinite capacity for for the moment. I I do want to kind of ask you, and and maybe we can go to the next slide um, because I think that you know that one's pretty telling. Do given the amount of money that we've seen in the direct lender um, community, do you think that that is a permanent 
new source of capital? Do you think that, you know, the, it's it's certainly yeah. displacing bank loan. It is now market a little bit. But I mean, the interesting thing about this or? chart. Yeah. I mean, historically, the, the direct lending has always been at a premium uh, right. to the broadly syndicated markets. And the, the chart sort of indicates that that's still true, although. Uh, the first podcast we did with with Randy Schwimmer, I mean, and a lot of other discussions would indicate that that's probably not as true right now because right. there's just not as much activity in the broadly syndicated market. They're probably comparable right now if you can actually close a deal. Uh, and, that, and that's a that's a big that's a big distinction. The direct lending market, you know, is still closing deals. I think, look, it's if when the CLO machine is running and the high yield funds are getting inflows because everybody feels safe, you know, putting money in bonds. It's those are cheaper. They're just inherently yeah. cheaper than the direct lending market. The certainty of execution is the main advantage of direct. So I, yeah. I think what's happened here is that the direct lenders have taken a much larger market share and they will not readily cede it back. So I, I think we're, right. you know, ask me that question in a year when when markets are more stable. But I, I think it's a permanent change in the landscape for sure. Right, right. I think it'll be interesting to see if it becomes more competitive or w whether it's complementary to the mm -hmm. bank loan market and or, and whether it's on a deal by deal basis or across the board. I think that you know, yeah. it'll be interesting. Probably all of the above. Yeah. All right. Let's get to the let's get to the good stuff. Okay. Uh, asset base market. Um, I'll, I'll let you I'll let you drive here, but let's start <laughs> with, you know, last year, 140 billion. I thought that was 40 percent above or just about 40 percent above the all time record. I thought, OK, things will cool off, but that does not seem to have happened here yeah. in, in the first half of the year. Yeah, yeah. I think in in the first half of the year, we just um, we had so many um, borrowers tap the market to um, transition away from LIBOR to um, the amendments for for SOFR. Um, we had record um, uh, quarter over quarter and um, near. I'm sorry, we had record quarterly volumes. Um, and then we had the second highest total uh, for half year volumes. Um, what we're seeing here is sort of the syndicated loan market, um, which is the broadly syndicated retail sell down of a loan. And then the clubbed um, volume, uh, which is the the um, deals that are, are really clubbed among a smaller number of lenders, not um broadly sold down to retail investors or or buy side opportunities so um you know the combination is 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 meaningful um and and um yeah i mean i think in both areas we've we've seen um we've seen substantial growth yeah the interesting thing uh that it's a little bit hard to see but the 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 red the dark line on the left chart is trending down so you have higher volume over time on a lower number of deals yeah uh, so the, deals, the big are, getting deals are getting bigger and banks are yeah. holding more and so the volume yeah. is coming from and we'll see this in the coming charts uh from an increase in existing issuers it's not a lot of new money coming into the space maybe we should get there right now actually let's talk about new money um well, I, I think that that's that's exactly right. Um, we saw a lot of new money. Um, it was almost uh, 20 billion in the first half of the year, as well as the the refinancings. But you know, again, in the absence of event driven transactions, most of the increases came via um, upsizings and 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 add-ons. Um, so, you know, you had borrowers that were not necessarily new to the ABL market um, returning. Um, so I guess my question to you is on the transactor side, um, you know, why do you think that there was so much new issuance from existing borrowers? Well, there's a lot a lot packed in there. I think uh, a couple of things really uh, worked really well in the first half of the year and just conversations with, with folks across the market. First is that inventory levels, working capital in general is elevated because you have combination of inflation, which is affecting uh, values and also supply chain issues, which is slowing down the turn. So more more working capital to be financed combined with and a lot of commodity price. Don't underestimate a lot of you know metals, food related, energy related. All yeah. those all those numbers going up are inflating the inventory. So companies are coming back to market 
to upsize their facility to take advantage of the availability that they have. But I think when you combine it with with what was really a dysfunctional uh, institutional market and high yield market in the last couple of years, we've seen low usage on ABL facilities and and just you know borrowing long in in the other markets. If you can't do that because the institutional market is just expensive, you'll borrow under the ABL. And so you're yep. seeing uh, companies right. more and more wanting to, to to maximize their availability, and that's that's what brought it back to market. Combined with, I think, still very attractive pricing, and we're gonna we're gonna see that in the uh, in the lower charts. Just give people an idea of um, some of the yep. largest deals. They're getting awfully large. I mean, without naming names on on live air, but I mean, you know, multi billion dollar facilities. There didn't used to be as many of them, but look at the size of these. They're eye popping, aren't yep. they? Yep, yep, they are. And I think it's also just really key to note um, these examples just again, reiterate what we've been saying. There were no opportunistic event-driven transactions of size that that came to market. So, you know, most of them were, um, you know, certainly there were some new lender, uh, new borrowers in the space, but most of them were upsizings. And, and, um, yeah. and I think that, you know. And really with a couple of exceptions, the new borrowers are relatively small facilities. Yes. And that's, yes. um, that jumps exactly. out as well. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. We. I stuck a couple of slides into your your beautiful deck, Maria. But the <laughs> these are these are numbers. There. There's a quarter lag. So, but these are coming from the Secured Finance Network survey, um, and I just think they they're a really good companion to what we were just talking about in terms of volumes. The the utilization levels in both bank and non-bank lenders. Uh, tra- you can you can see what happened. There was a there was a spike in in, in early stage of the pandemic, and then it dropped very low. Those are those numbers in the 30s are very low from a historical standpoint and then moving back up. So you've got 40 plus percent in Q1. It'll be higher, I suspect, in Q2, much higher for the non-bank lenders because they don't have the other types of debt in the capital structure. But that's a huge I mean, if you combine the upsizing of the facilities with the higher utilization and then the other chart that I want to share here is these are getting at the fact that credit quality in the asset based market has never actually been better. Uh, maybe a slight increase in, in criticized and classified reported, but it's it's marginal. And if on a long term view, the portfolios are as clean as they've ever been, probably cleaner. You have a you have I, I would suspect that people who are who are watching this and thinking about it are saying, yeah, we are having a really good year. And I guess that's a lot of it. You know, more usage, uh, new opportunities to put capital to work and very, very clean credit. And that's that's a, that's a that's a really good year for the industry. And I think that's. That's probably the best way to put it. It's it's as good as it gets, I think. Yeah. No, other I than think. new event-driven financings. Yep. No, I think that's exactly right. Let's talk about uh, maybe just give people some perspective. What this is um this is back to refinitive numbers. So I'll let you drive it. Sure. So I mean, in in terms of the industries that have um, industry borrowers who have tapped the market, you know, we've seen from 2001 to year to date there have been some changes. Um, the uh, retail and supermarket industry make up a smaller proportion of the ABL pipeline so far this year. They um, their pro rata share actually dropped from about 21 percent to 15.4 um, percent between year end uh, 2001 and the end of 1Q or uh, 1H uh, 2022. Um, In contrast, we've seen areas of growth. So general manufacturing increased um, their share of the market of total issuance, 13.4% for uh, full year 2001. Um, It it went up to 17.7% in the first six months of 2022. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we saw oil and gas financings uh make up about 14 percent of year-to-date um issuance which is you know up significantly from the smaller share i suspect driven by the the commodity price increases that that you saw and the manufacturing has a lot of um equipment rental i suspect in it and that's um that's a big feature of the 20 the first half numbers is that a lot of the large uh, equipment rental companies came back to market there they're 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 reinvesting in their fleet because they're they're doing well. The the prices of the inventory are up, and they couldn't tap other markets as efficiently. So a lot of upsizing activity there as well. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about let's talk about pricing. Uh, right. 
What do you, uh, it looks pretty stable to me. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's it's really stable. If, if nothing else, ABL is stable. Um, and and I, I would even go so far as to say it's stable and, and the deals are pricing at the tighter end of, of the um, uh, credit of the spread spectrum. So, you know, about 43% of the deals based on these charts um, are pricing at uh, 125 basis points over term SOFR or 150 um, basis points over um, term um, SOFR. And, and, you know, I think that's a testament to the ABL loan structure and the comfort that comes from that. And, and, and I think it's just um, a testament to the quality of the assets and, and mm -hmm. that lenders can get comfortable with, you know, what, Kind of, what is your takeaway for as yeah. a as a long term banker? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I I I think you know always have to be careful when you talk about pricing. But I would I would right. say this that the uh, 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 the 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 standalone yields have gotten quite a bit better, even if it's, it's static pricing because the usage is higher. I mean, the non use fee is not very attractive, and the fact that borrowers are borrowing more means that the yields in the portfolios are higher. I would say. It just seems like human nature to me that, you know, if high yield bonds are gapping out by hundreds of basis points and term loans are gapping out and the direct lenders are gapping out, maybe not quite as much, but also uh, looking at relative value. And, and, and you're, the, you're in a bank and you're saying, well, you know, we want to we want to deploy capital, but we, we you know, there's not as much capital markets income this year. I would I would think that there's a lot of people trying to figure out how to get better yield. But it is a very competitive market, and that's why it's always been so stable. These these loans perform well, and uh, uh, you know, it, it also interesting. It is, as you said, Maria, very tightly packed in that 125 to 150. There's a the average is higher because there's always a tail of more expensive deals that get refinanced. But the new deals, the kind of on the run, seems to be in that very tight range with very few below that. And the transition to SOFR has been very orderly as well in this yeah. in this market. Yep, very much yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here's your here's the relative value chart. What do you see yep. here? Yep. So, you know, I think that what this shows us, I mean, I think that the part that's, you know, not terribly surprising is that the ABL pro rata um pricing is comparatively um the the lowest um, between, you know, triple, uh, I'm sorry, double B, single B, um, pro rata and, and, and institutional. Um, you know, I, again, I think it, it's, it highlights the fact that the ABL structure pres um, offers kind of a, a stable market, low cost environment for um, uh, given the potential industries, given the potential credit rating. And, um, you know, and I think increasingly, and, and you and I have talked about this, there's there's a relationship element that comes mm -hmm. into play, right? That's right. And, and so you should, you know, um, I'm sure you have thoughts about that, but it, it just <laughs> all comes together so that pricing. But it jumps off the chart. The asset based for the rating, for the equivalent right. rating is the most attractive pricing that any borrower can can find. Uh, and, uh, and right now it's the it's the most wide open market, too, because it's bank funded. Right. As opposed to yep. uh, uh, flow based. So here, here's a chart, Maria, that uh, we've been working on, and I, I want you to walk through it, but this is not something that's been uh, shown a lot, so I hope everybody watching pays very close attention. This is really interesting stuff. How big how big is the asset-based market was the question we were trying to address a couple of years ago, and this is where we started yeah. because these are good numbers. Yep. So, so the way we approach this is, you know, we've always known that the ABL market has been able to refinance um, um, existing debt very steadily push out maturities, and and so we've been tracking the ABL maturing volume stats for for a while. Um, but what we did is we sort of dug a, a little bit deeper to, to to kind of discern a little bit more information. And what the chart on the left does is it it really shows us that outstanding commitments in the ABL space have grown over time. And, and I think that that's really indicative of the overall health 
of the ABL market. The fact, as you've noted throughout our chat, um, kind of the growth and utilization rates that have um, um, that borrowers have increased uh, their usage and and their capacity, and and just overall, again, that despite broader market volatility. Um, for the ABL lender, it's it's been a really strong first half of the year. Um, I mean, we we have seen year over year, quarter over quarter increases mm -hmm. in committed ABL financing. Right, right. So you've got uh, uh, to me the thing that really jumped out was, and this is maybe gets to a little bit of a forecast, but of the commitments in the in the market of the three hundred and 28 billion at the end right. of the second half, you've got 68% of them have come to market and been done in the last 18 months. And so if you if you sort of follow that, like that's like cleaning out the closets, right? I mean, they're just it doesn't <laughs> feel like, unless we see more commodity inflation that drives higher borrowing bases, if we see, I guess if pricing ticked downward, people might do opportunistic refinancings. But the idea that 70% of the market has come in the last 18 months, means that those borrowers are pretty in pretty good shape from a liquidity standpoint, unlikely to immediately come back unless there's something driving it. I would right. I would say volume falls. What do you what do you think? Second half of the year? I think that makes sense. I think I mean, I think generally um, if I were to take a guess right now and whip out my crystal ball, I, I think that the second half of the year is going to be quieter, barring any major um, changes largely in 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 terms of certainly headlines but i think just confidence and mm -hmm. and the ability to to be able to you know structure an underwrite for an event di driven deal or something like that i i think you're spot on mm -hmm. um that brings us to the end any other uh prognostication any other forecasts you want to share with the, the group before we part no, I mean, I think um, I, I, I just I think especially in this type of market, you know, the value of ABL is 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 there for all to see. So, you know, um, you, uh, you know, uh, me and I'm I'm just always kind of waving the ABL flag. I think the numbers back up everything I've been, yeah. <laughs> you know, cheering about. So there we go. Great. I agree. Thank you. Well, it's been it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Maria. Likewise, uh, we'll we'll you. do it again in a quarter, right? We'll see what uh, whether we were right or not. Whether it would be my pleasure. Thank okay. you. That concludes this episode of the In the Know podcast. Thanks again to Hilco Global for their sponsorship of the In the Know series. 